Three Points of Articulation Podcast. Hello, welcome to the Three Points of Articulation Podcast. I am your host with a tear in my eye, the big tasty Jamie Wills, joined as per normal by my two co-hosts, Adam the Wrestling Man. How are you? I am good. It's all fair to Adam. Good. Uh, and Johnny wearing a, a splendid Ormond Warrior t-shirt. Johnny Flashback, how are you doing? I'm good, Puff. I didn't get the memo about using a court to um, start off the podcast again. I thought we dropped all that shit. We did. I just one, one was a bit more relevant to the Rumble. Um, so we're, covering, we're covering the Rumble 92 this week. Uh, not sure where Adam was going with his. So. Fair to I'm not sure if mine was relevant. No, so I'm not sure where you were going with yours. What, what did you even say? Heenan, Heenan always said it was not fair to Fleur all the way through it. Oh. So I said it's fair to Adam. So I didn't make the connection. Um, but yeah, we're covering the 92 Rumble this week. Um, probably by the most nostalgia-filled Rumble you're going to experience. Make sure you stay tuned in for that. Um, New Year, boys. Did you have any New Year's resolutions for me at all, Adam? Did you make any resolutions? Um, well, I've been pretty much laid out for two weeks, um, just being ill, but non-COVID ill, so I didn't get any time off work or anything. So my New Year's resolution is just to get my body working again and get fit again. And flashback. Yeah, no real resolution, just maybe start eating a bit better, but I knew I wouldn't do it right after New Year, so I'm going to give myself like two weeks or so to eat all the biscuits and all the chocolate in the house first. Well, I said the same, but I went out for a roast yesterday. It was uh, splendid. I had a lot of veg with it. I had vegan ice cream afterwards, so evens it out probably. Which is good. Oh, also, I found out that my dad listens to this podcast as well. So big shout out to Gary, uh, wherever you're listening. Um, right, Gaza. No, big Gaza. Oh, he loves it. Right, let's move on to some news then, boys, shall we? Uh, what was that? I love it. Do you not remember that one? It's another quote from the Rumble. <laughs> no. Um, I don't, don't even watch the right one. We... Probably not. No. no. Um, yeah, we want some new news. <laughs> news. News world all the time now. We're covering literally everything uh, this week. We've got a big old variety in there. Uh, let's get started. Should we just start with some cello? I'm sure you guys both uh, tucked into my interview with uh, with Jack Slime from FC T- uh, Collections. Uh, what would you guys think of the, of the line after the interview? Is that his real name? Jack Slime, yeah. I was good, man. Yeah, <laughs> uh, he was really, really knowledgeable. I um, think you maybe uh, you maybe pressed him a little bit uh, over what was coming out a little bit more than you probably should have. Um, but yeah, he he handled stuff quite well, and he seems really enthusiastic about stuff, and that's just what you want to see. Yeah, absolutely. He seems to know his stuff. He's well into the BCA line, like yourself. So um, looks like it's in good hands, and uh, did enjoy the interview. He did did well. Once again, with the, the bone crushing sessions. Yes, crushing's the the key word there. But uh, I don't want to say I pushed him too much. I think it was a bit of uh, a bit of elasticating, should we say? Just like a bit of stretching. But you've got to sometimes, don't you? Just to try and get some form of an exclusive out of him. But um, just before we came on air, uh, he revealed the Ottomo Dragon uh, and the Sunny Ono two pack that's coming out, which. Um, Obviously, you said in the interview that the body for Ottawa Dragon's been used already. Johnny, you had a bit of uh, an idea as to who it was. Yeah, I mean, you can't really mistake the lower body, at least, as a, a Ken Shamrock BC with the kick pads. So that would be my prediction of who's to come. Um, I know as of this recording, he's got one up his sleeve to, to announce. It's supposed to be a really big name. I suppose it fits, but I don't know if the, the Nitro set picture was a clue or not so I'm not sure if that um, if that's going to be this series or next series yeah I'm going Brian Adams or Scott Steiner I mean they said A plus so more likely to be Scott Steiner but depends whether it's the kind of crush mould of Brian Adams because I would still class that as kind of A range in WWF A plus wow that's a that's a sort of um... I, said a. I, d- I didn't quite say plus 
No, they, I, I don't know if that's what if that's what they said. Then you know oh, it yeah. has to be a big name to set themselves up for failure. If not, so you're right. It, it can't really be Brian Adams. I wouldn't put him in that A category. So Scott Steiner is is there. He's not getting an A plus for his maths, is he? Then again, I have heard that someone called the Macho Man Randy Savage is open to the same sort of deal um, that Andre the Giant is. So he can have figures outside of WWE. So maybe maybe that's what it could be. Yeah, I'm not sure if um, the little Nitro thing was a ruse, truth be told, or like a red herring, should we say. Um, the, the, the whole see no evil, hear no evil, so blah, blah, blah wasn't it? Um, I think it might be Jim Nighthard in the in the Who outfit, personally. But definitely not A plus if it is. Well, yeah. in, in the BCA world, I would class Jim Nighthard as A plus because that's the one that we've been missing for. Uh, but not in that outfit. That wouldn't be what people want. No, but um, we'll have to see on that one. I mean, Andre could be a potential. Um, I was Never know, but. but I'll, I would doubt Andre at this point. And I don't think he's going to go down the route of anyone outside that area by the sounds of it. Hmm. So, you it know... The giant. Sorry, who was that? Giant. Could be the Giant. What, do you mean Big Show? Or... Yeah. Well, why? I would have thought we would have exclusive deals with AEW, but I'm not sure how any of these things work. Well, because DVP does have mentioned as well, but once again, I think also it would fit into the... The, the error of it but I don't think you can get yeah. your hands up for a, the old I time. mean setting yourselves up for failure I think this whole conversation is setting us up to look a bit stupid when yeah. <laughs> when they reveal let's go back to Ultimo Dragon and Sonny Ono then <laughs> they'll probably yeah. reveal it before this even goes out anyway um, yeah. yeah so all my Dragon Guns re- removable entrance gear which uh, I quite like about it obviously I'm going to display it with the entrance gear on Quite the idea with it. Sonny I know is going to be the same as like a Bob Backlund um, manager figure with no bone, bone crunch in action with it. It makes a lot of sense. I think there's there's good toyetic um, value for us, especially Ultimore Dragon. And you know, if you're just going to get Sonny Ono as a side piece, it's a, it's a good decision to make. You know, if they're going to make a, a wrestler with a manager, as you say, the, the manager doesn't have much articulation or whatever so it's not going to cost as much so hopefully you wouldn't see that it costs the same amount as two figures but maybe the cost of one and a half one and three quarter figures when it finally comes out we said it was the same price point as what the retros would be so the blue meanie and the josh shernoff figures they were 30 is that right yeah uh, i can't remember i think actually 25 for, for that set so, I mean, yeah, that, that is what yeah, I'd be doing. Um, another interesting point, because when we discussed in the last episode about the Brian Clark and Adam Bomb debate and why they couldn't use the Adam Bomb name, um, yeah. when I point to him, well, during the interview as well as off camera, he said obviously that they didn't want to get involved in that. Um, but the reason for it is because the tops actually own the right to Adam Bomb because of the garbage pail kids. Um, so, on certain things, they can't use the Adam Bomb name. Um, yeah, that, I said I said last time there was a garbage pail kid called Adam Bomb, didn't I? Yeah, so, he did. Yeah. Um, so that's why they're, they're not they're not using this. It was just in case he said because um, people know who Brian Clark is, regardless of if you put Adam Bomb or not. Interesting. Mm. Playing it safe. We also had Dwayne Gill uh, released in the bone crushing um, style as well um, in his Gilberg attire, which. Um, so I thought we'll go for the, the sort of job squad one, but there's a bit of range there if we go forward. Maybe in the next series or future series, they can have a, a job squad with Dwayne Gill. But yeah, Gilbert's good enough. Fits into the era well, and it's a memorable character, isn't it? I, I was thinking that it could come with a T-shirt. Do BCAs come with anything like that? Because I'm not a big BCA oh, fan. Do. Like Kurgan. Oh, uh, yeah, Kurgan, Kurgan had the tie-dye, didn't he? Yeah, he came with the tie-dye and, like... A few others and so on do come with etc. Like JR come with a headset and Jim Cornette with a, but certain ones do, but not many. The majority of them are molded on. If somebody came with a Job Squad T-shirt in the range, if they do the whole Job Squad, then that'd be perfect to stick on on Gilberg. Yeah, you always get a custom one pretty easy if you really insist. 
It's just nice to be an official one, isn't it? Um, well, as official as you can be. But um, yeah, it also fit nice on the hardcore Holly um, that come out as well around well, with the job squad attire. Um, um, any other points on the BCA line? Um, actually, regarding Gilbert, I think they've done a good job with the body. It looks unique. So it, it's not muscly. It's very like sort of representative of, of who, who he was and who he is in terms of the look of him. So I hope he's a bit thinner as well than the others. I was going to say, he, he kind of went through the range of being really skinny and then had a podge on him. So you you could kind of link it to anything. It's, it's a decent body, yeah. Um, the artist seems really good. It's called Matty Breeze. If you guys ever get a set, look him up. He's um, he's been quite good with all the the artwork. He's done, doing the design, the boxing, as well as the figures, which is, which is handy. Um, I'm just going to touch on the Figures Toys Company, Tom Pritchard, uh, because we announced that on, the, on our Facebook page. Not fully up to date with his in-ring work, but could you review enlighten me on sort of how, how accurate the attire is and, and how good it is, really? I think with anything with FTC, you know, you're going to get a draw and you're going to get a sculpt and they're going to look good at this point. But when it comes out, they've always been disappointing. So I'm not going to hold my breath for it being that good when it comes out. Uh, that said, it is pretty accurate. It's exactly what he wore to the ring in terms of the heavenly bodies era of, of his work. So uh, it's something I would like to see in a, in a retro form, to be honest. So. It's a very smart decision by them because people have kind of, it's not been a massive deal getting heavenly bodies, but they are one of the teams that have obviously never had anything produced. I think a lot of people that don't like this company might buy two of these to get the coats, the jackets, and to make their own customs or to buy their customs of heavenly bodies. So I think it's a wise decision. I mean, you say that, but you've always seen that they're a bit bigger than elite, so the jackets would be a bit, you know, sort of, too baggy on them. So I know. I know what you're saying. Maybe if they come out a bit, maybe they just turn over new leaf. They could even be good. In a different world. <laughs> um, we'll see when they come out. This new. Yeah, the the images the... look good. I've got a feeling they won't match the product. Yeah. Um. Back to WWE now. So they've announced the Ultimate Edition 12. So we knew Alexa Bliss was coming out. We weren't too sure on, well, we didn't know about The Fiend, but they announced them both together. Um, it's going to be the Mania 37 Fiend that's coming out, not the Burnt Fiend from the images they released. But yeah, Mania 37, um, very strange decision that they've announced this now, especially after they released them a few months ago. Um, I don't think another Elite Fiend's, need, Ultimate Fiend's needed, but Johnny, I'm not sure, uh, you won't be getting this, but what's your thoughts on the strange decision? The most have already made it, so they're going to release it. That's all I'm seeing and all I'm thinking about it. They've they've, they've done it already before the release, so they, they need to sell it. What where else can they do? You know, mm. otherwise lose all the money they spent on it. What is is the WrestleMania fiend much different to what we've had? I mean, I can't recollect it. He um, they had like a bulletproof vest thing on. Johnny he come out after being burnt. It looked a bit different, different jacket on, I think. Um, yeah. I'd quite like to see him release this as a two pack. I know it's a bit weird, but people are going to want the Alexa Bliss figure. People might not want the Fiend one, and I think Ultimates will sell anyway. It's not going to happen. So, well. so they won't buy them individually. So why would they buy them together? Because people are going to want the Alexa Bliss one. People are going to buy the Alexa Bliss one because she has fans and it's an Ultimate figure. So you crossing that Venn diagram. I just think with The Fiend, you're not really getting that. It's his last match, though. Maybe people have been invested because of that. It's not a memorable one, though, is it? No, not for me. But no. There's too many places seen. they could go with Alexa. Um, there's too much they could put in the box. So it's definitely not going to be a two-pack. No. Have a little swing in there, couldn't they? I don't know, Lily. Um, Elite 93 was also revealed. So um, they had some sort of images and, and someone come up from those. Uh, Raquel Gonzalez come out. Talk about Raquel first because it's her first time in the uh, in the line with that with the NXT uh, Women's Title. 
looks quite scary. The hairline looks all over the shop. Um, apart from that, the size looks okay. Adam, not sure. Yeah, like, like, exactly like you say, the actual body type of the figure looks really good. Uh, Facial-wise, I hope they get it right. It doesn't look dead on, uh, but I hope they get it right. Interesting to see what the title will be. Are, are they going to actually correct anything? NXT women's title, or are they going to leave it? To answer your question, I very much doubt they're going to resize the belt, which is the only issue with it that really needs to be addressed. They need to resize the women's title be to be smaller than the men's title. Um, but I and thought have the, the, and have the word woman's on it. <laughs> that would help as well. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I thought the face looked good and yeah, good good figure. Good to pick up for those NXT fans. Um in the opposite of the face that's good, Seth Rollins is up next. He's got quite the butter face on him. Um, attire wise, looks really good. And the uh, the jacket looks looks well molded. The trousers look good. Glove in one hand, but face wise, just looks a bit looks a bit too Greek. Um, Johnny, I agree with you. Then um, I thought it was all right, but yeah, not brilliant. Nothing I can add to that. Exactly the same. That's good. Uh, how about some T-Bar though, Adam? I know you're a fan of these toyetic figures. T-Bar from Retribution. Yeah. The standout one for me. Um, body shape looks decent. Uh, mask looks really good. It's toyetic. As much as you hate Retribution, that figure is a toyetic figure. And I think it'll be one that I get. I think I'm going to try and get a Retribution set. Um, obviously, I'll have to customise uh, Slapjack. They're not going to release him. Um, but yeah, toyetic, really good. They have released him, haven't they? Just I think his job. <laughs> Has he been released yet? Shane Yeah. You know, you said Slapjack. I was thinking that was um, Dominic Dijakovic. So it shows how much I know about like this group. <laughs> I honestly don't even recall seeing them in any show I've watched because I don't watch Raw. I can't remember them being on any pay per view. So, but no connection whatsoever with this group. Uh, Dijakovic is the one that we're talking about now, T-Bar. I've lost, I've lost track of what we've been <laughs> talking about, so yeah. Um, I think Slapjack had a US title match, I think, with Bobby Lashley, if I'm right, um, yeah, That's probably their only reign. Uh, Ricky Steamboat is the chase for the figure. So you got the, the ordinary is the white, uh, the yellow is the chase. Um, Adam, you had some choice words to say about this. Yeah, it's a terrible figure. Um, I didn't even really look at the body shape or anything. The face just puts me off buying it straight away. Um, looks like Quagmire from Family Guy. Um, just weird chin and cheeks. Fortunately, the jaw is too big, but the rest of the figure is quite good. Even like the, the if you put the top of their head, it looks okay with the eyes and nose, but chin, mouth downwards is awful. And the attire is really good. And the belt's cool. So, still um, want it. <laughs> yeah, I think if you pop a different head on it, it'd be, um, be okay, it would Maybe, but, I mean, the Ricky Steamboat heads that have been released so far are all the same. Other than the most recent one, which is kind of touched up with the special effects or whatever you call it. Got a bit of stubble on one of them, not Um. Yeah. And Cesaro is up last um, from his like his run last year that he had briefly. Um, very bland looking figure with his jacket, but um, yeah, there we go. Any got any opinions on Cesaro before we move over? The jacket's all right; it makes it stand out a little bit. But you know, I'm not going to be running out to buy it or anything. It's going to be very bland underneath. Hmm. Um, interesting you say that because I thought it looked. Like one of the better ones of the series, uh, the face scan and sculpt. But I mean, I'm not sold on the jacket. I don't recall wearing that, but I think the base figure itself is pretty good. But again, like it's, it's, it's Cesaro is quite bland sort of figure. Doesn't seem to sell too well, especially basics in terms of what's on my eBay and things like that. So I don't know if it's going to sell, but I do like it. It's good. I think about about the Cesaro blandness. I think they had a good opportunity a few years ago to have like a removable suit, like they have with the Angel Gaza. Yeah, um, I'm surprised they didn't right. go on that route. He did have a removable suit in the bar figure, elite figure. 
Oh, there we go. I meant like the actual, do we need to come out entrance wise and and just pull yeah. it off? Yeah, that's yeah. Fine. Good. Um, so AEW have had the unmatched series three revealed. Uh, we actual we've seen, seen the, the images and who it's going to be, but we've had the actual physical figures now, um, imaged. Uh, Evil Uno will be up first because it seems apt. Um, once again, very toyetic. They've done quite a good job on his mask as well. Adam, I know you're are you a fan of the Evil Uno. I think you are, aren't you? Yeah, definitely. I was I was at the um, Double or Nothing where he made his debut, uh, came out, and I've been a fan ever since. He's a great wrestler. He he lost a few pounds a while ago, which seemed to improve his uh, his in ring movements and stuff like that. Since that happened, they seem to have relegated him to losing on dark and elevation. But as far as the uh, figure wise. This is definitely the standout of the series. Uh, and to be fair to this whole line, this whole figure series, uh, it's the only one I've been excited about in a while. So I'll probably get them all apart from the LJN rubbish. Well, I mean, the LJN is actually not coming out with a series. Um, it's been delayed. Um, but I think Jeremy Padawa said that he's not been happy with the sizing. Doesn't It's not authentic LJN is what he said. Um, I'm not fully sure what that means, but um, yeah, it's just not coming out. It didn't fit in with the series either, to be honest. So. I think it was made and it was too small. Um, I think it's not as tall as the LGNs or, as, or even t- as tall as the, the Cordy figure. So that will redo it, which is a good thing. And it's, it shows that they actually sort of care and what the Pirelle rather than that series one, which they put out, which was horrendous with the, the silly skin tones, but they still release it. So hopefully they're learning from mistakes and it's, it's always better to redo something that isn't right. Definitely. Uh, Stu Grayson up next as well, just to go with his uh, evil partner. Um, I think this was very good as a figure. I was very sceptical when it first came out. I think head-wise they could have done a little bit better to make the beard look a bit more solid as it is in real life, if that makes any sense. But um, yeah, I think it looks fine as a figure itself. I'd, uh, I'd be getting that one. Johnny? No, I agree with you. I didn't see any issues with the face or beard myself. I thought it looked really good. I think he's slightly... It's going to sound horrible for him, but he's slightly wrinkled. He's chiselled and he's wrinkled on his face. And he doesn't quite portray that on the head. It's quite quite plain and quite smooth, if you know what I mean. Uh, body-wise, this is a brilliant figure. And they've really captured the fact that he's really ripped. Um, so, yeah, brilliant. Great figure. And um, Anna Jay is also up as well because um, he's going to go to take on T, I think he's from Series 2. Um, she's also the Chase, which for someone out of all of them who's probably the least toyetic, we say, out of all the entire series, it's strange they've gone for, for her as the Chase in there. An easy repaint, do you reckon, Adam? Yeah, I think you've, you've nailed that there. Um, it was quite disappointing. There's plenty of places they could have gone with, you know, the two years that Dark Order have been there um, with the others, with Uno and with Grayson. Um, just disappointing, really. The figure's nice. The figure's good. But it didn't need to be the chase. I think at this point, with the price the chase is going for and the fact that we don't have seem to have the ability to find them in the UK, I don't really care what's the chase, what's not. So they can do what they want. And in fact, the, the less, you know... The more the same the figure is to the normal one, it makes it even more the better. There, because we're not going to get them. No, yeah. I'd, I'd like, I'd like it. I hear me out on this one. I'd like it if a chase of the whole series wasn't Alex Reynolds. To so say if they just released three thousand or five thousand of Alex Reynolds, just to get him in the series, but at the same time makes them a lot harder to find. Um. Rather than just having, because he's not in the series, but he's a part of the Dark Order. Go on, Johnny, shaking your head. No, I'm just shaking my head at what you just said. I do not want that at all, because then you wouldn't be able to get an Alex Reynolds figure. Yeah, when completely. They will eventually re- release it, so it'll mm. be coming. Completely agree with Jono, and you know, you you haven't got Alan Angels yet, you've not got Preston Vance yet. So. I think they came later, though, didn't they? Those two in the actual group. They definitely came later, but not too much. No, nah, so I think it was Uluna was first, then Stu Grayson, then John Silver, who was up next, and then Alex Reynolds, wasn't it? So, um, yeah, John Silver, um, 
looks great. I'm really happy with this figure, how it's turned out. Um, you've got two heads. So you've got like a serious head from when he first started, and then you've got the sort of smiling, open mouth um, John Silver head as well. Um, Johnny, let's come to you. Yeah, I think I've only seen one of the heads, and I wasn't too convinced of it. So I was quite surprised you seeing that. It almost seems like anything I think is a good head, you would see is a bad one and vice versa, which is... Well, there's there's the... Um, opinions in it. The other head in the box. It's hard to tell from your image because of the quality and stuff, but... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I wasn't as impressed with this face as I was, say, Stu Grayson. Yeah, I completely agree with Jono. It's not quite right. It's, you know, your average man with a beard. Um, there's nothing that really shouts out John Silver for me, to be honest. No, the one sure. thing that's going to have to make this figure is the scale of it. It has to be, you know, five foot four, wherever he is. It has to be representative of his actual height. And, and if it does it, then it's kind of going to be a fail. Yeah, it's, it's going to have to be, because he's quite a solid little thing, isn't he? Like someone poured a packet of peanuts in a condom, looking at him. Um, Brody Lee is up last, who um, probably in the, was going to be the most sought after one in the series. They've made him into the um, the rare figure as well, out of the chase, one of 5,000. So um, he's going to be sought after, the chase will be even more sought after. So um, can't wait for those. Adam, you happy with the fact that he's going to get a chase? Yeah, definitely. I think everybody wants uh, wants him, to be honest, out of this whole series. If you're not a kind of weirdo like me who will want um, Evil Uno straight away, you want Brody Lee, don't you, if you're a general wrestling fan? So to get the chance of getting two, uh, if you're in America, uh, is great. Um, my first thought when I first saw it was, where's the jacket and stuff like that? But I get they're going to release ringside exclusives with jackets and stuff, so I can deal with that. It's okay. I wouldn't say it's absolutely remarkable. It's okay. I thought it was very good. I wouldn't say remarkable either, but very good. I probably rated a bit more than you seem to. And yeah, I agree about the the court. You didn't you don't have to have it with every release or so something to look forward to in a, in a later figure. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think they could have released anything with this Brody figure, truth be told, and people don't buy it, aren't they? Yeah, also regarding the chase, I'm pleased that the the normal version is that because it's better than the chase in my opinion so yeah yeah happy with the way they've done it and you get a tnt title with the um original nice the correct tnt title oh, looks a bit which um yeah. ready to see um and also in i don't know if it's just an american exclusive or not but upper deck uh, are also releasing trading cards in this series so um interesting to see how they turn out Adam might be the man for that to comment on. I mean, history's shown that it doesn't really have that much appeal because you used to have your NXT ones, like your Amer the ones that were just available in America had um, cards like Gargano and Champa had cards. And, you know, they haven't taken off. It's not like everyone's chomping at the bit to get these cards or anything. Um, it's a little feature on the box. It's something extra for people, but I don't think it's anything that will demand... A, a, re a return of money or that everyone will be seriously collecting I'll have to take your word for it yeah well we'll wait and see when they come out I'm sure they'll be out in America and then about eight months later they come over here so um, whilst we've got a few minutes left we've left the news boys Ringside re revealed their top 20 selling uh, figures for the year um, well I've run down a little top 20 see if we agree with them um, no, 20 top 10 Jamie Top 10. <laughs> okay. Well, top 10 is the uh, Jurassic Express standard figures, the, the two pack. Uh, Hulk Hogan Survivor Series, and then nine. Uh, John Moxley Series 2, right? Yep, uh, is number eight. Uh, Sting Luminaries from Unmatched is number seven. Uh, Luchasaurus, number six. A little bit, little bit of the Bubbly, uh, number five. Cactus Jack, number four. Edge Elite 36, Elite 83, sorry, um, standard edition in number three. Um, number two, any of you guys guess number two? Oh, my warrior, I'm a warrior. Number two, uh, number one, we all have it. 
is the Cody oh. Rhodes Double or Nothing exclusive TNT title pack. Very good. Um, it's very AEW heavy there, so it shows like the collectors are probably wanting these AEW figures a lot more than your, your, your normal child or whatever. And um, Edge 83 is probably the only surprise in there. It just seems a bit random. It's a, a normal eight of Edge. Yeah. I don't know if he was heavily reduced or something at some point. Not even the chase, which is weird. Um I was going to say, is the chase included in those kind of figures? Or I believe so, yeah, because it would say chase. There's not one on here to sort of say any otherwise, but Keith Lee's 14 and he has a chase, so whether they just send them out randomly. Um, Jungle Boy is also... I remember. I know that Ringside do send out AEW chases randomly. They don't sell them separately, but I think they oh. do sell the WWE as a... You're right. A separate entity. Yeah, I remember seeing them now thinking, what's the point in that? Um, yeah, Cody Rhodes was number one, which makes sense because you see quite a lot of them now on the uh, on the secondary, didn't you? Yeah. It, um, it's, a, it's a fair one for me. It's a, it's a cracking figure. Perfect. Well, glad we've all picked that up, uh, which is, we'll have a look now at our uh, lovely little pickups. Uh, let's have a look at those then, shall we, boys? Pick me up, it's time now, looking at all of our latest episodes, uh, all of our latest pickups, sorry, since the latest episode uh, over the Christmas period. Um, I'll kick off first. Uh, so, John, you showed yours off on the last episode. I shall now show mine off. It's the uh, Joey figure, the Joey Knight, Shadow Toys figure. And here it is in all of its glory. He also sent me a little Joey buddy in there as well, so... Oh, favouritism is a joy. Where's my joy, buddy? You probably might get yours in your next delivery. Um, Bloody better, you know. Mm. Um, yeah. Let's crack him open, shall we? Go on, then. Crack him open. The bubble comes, up. It comes up quite nicely from the card. Yeah, it did. Which is nice. There is little Joey. It's rotatable waist, tight as anything. There he is up to the camera there. Very nice. There's our Joey. Um, Figure-wise, looks looks quite good. Got his little pearly white teeth in there. Um, a few less grey hairs than normal. Hey, Joey. Cheeky. But, um, yeah, good figure all round. Certainly better than the oldest. Yeah, a bit like my figure. A few less greys in the beard. Hmm. Um, yeah, we've got to wait for the green one to arrive now and the uh, the purple one. You not got a purple one yet? Yeah, uh, well, no, it's not arrived yet. Um, I only picked up, he messaged me and said he's got, I think someone ordered a purple or didn't pay for it. So he says no one of those spare wanted it. So I took that. Right. Oh, very good. Very good. Well done. Right, we'll stick with Cello for, for my next one then, and we'll go with the, what everyone's been receiving along with Joy's. It's the Dynamite Kid. And Adam's got them as well. Jimmy, not pick them up? No, not for me, that. Um, I think the, the issue that a lot of us, and we've already said it, is like the, the cape inside the package is a bit like a, a hoodie almost. Seems like a Packed a bit wrong, unfortunately, and I don't think the face is screaming dynamite. Unfortunately, just to be a bit of critical, lovely body though. I was actually pleasantly surprised. I don't think the cape is as misplaced, but maybe it's just mine because obviously they will be very slightly different in each pack. Um, it's no. quite even. It's quite even in mine. I mean, you can still compare it to Dracula, but it's it's still quite even. But yeah. You've got to take it out, haven't you? To get the full aspect of this figure, it's got to come off guard. I don't think it's that bad in the face. I can see what you mean. But then again, is any figure from Hasbro absolutely nailed on? No. So if they're meant to recreate those, it's not going to be. Fair point. Yeah, I understand what you mean. We've got the red flare in them. It's the perfect there. They're enhanced to be more toyetic, aren't they? So I guess that makes sense. I, I used to go through and open these, but... I'm... Like I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm a bit un, 
not sold about opening them and, and display them as loose because of the unfortunate scaling issues that we're seeing. I, I believe um, the Dynamite is just as tall as, you know, some of the other taller ones that we've seen. Sure. And taller than the Hasbro British Bulldog. So uh, I think they look awesome in the package, especially like this classic version. I know Al Snow has gotten different packaging but I hope they stick with this I know Joy's is slightly different on colour as well so um, yeah keep them coming please keep the same package all the way through Chella <laughs> we shall see are we back to me Um, we haven't taken a trip to BTA town in a while so let's do it Um, the missus asked me one for Christmas I said I don't know, as I say every year, um, and then just sort of wrote a few things. A jackal uh, in the two pack, so the jackal and the Kurgan um, two pack, very similar to the Sunny Ono and the um, Ulmo Dragon we we're gonna have from Shella. So the bone crushing on one of them, not on the other. Is what I mean by that. I think that was a very thoughtful gift. Um, She's done well. Yeah, definitely. So I need um, definitely the jackal. In my, so uh, are you opening that? Yes. Very well. Um, it's annoying, mate. I saw a loose one yesterday on Facebook for like four or five quid, which is a bit annoying. But it's got that. But um, all, all the same. It's a, a thoughtful present. Yeah, I'll, I'll um, I'll go back to myself and another thoughtful present, which <laughs> I never thought I wanted until I got it. But it's this Ultimate Warrior T-shirt. As you can see on screen, it's very sort of airbrushed, almost like a football top in the way it feels. Nylon, is that what you call it? <laughs> so yeah. Very, very colourful. Um, this is originally meant to be a birthday present, but she ordered a small and it came and it was like the size of a child's thing. So it was too big. Made a, com- made a complaint and they've sent a medium out, which is still a little bit short, to be honest, but it's much better, better fitting. Um, Packing on the muscle, Jono. Mm. I'm packing on the um, Christmas biscuits mm-hmm. and chocolate. <laughs> That's what I'm doing. Could do Looks good. Def- definitely a house T-shirt for me, that would be. I don't, I don't think I'd uh, have that one around the streets, but really good for lounging around, and I think. I reckon I probably would wear this out. Oh, I'd wear that out, 100%. <laughs> um, I'll wear anything out. Yeah, I think they could. I'm pretty sure. Um, all right, so AEW. I've I've almost. I think I've now got one. I've got a few loose ones on the way, so I've now got one of each guy, um, which is good. So L- Luchasaurus is one of the uh, the final ones on the list that I had. Very toyetic figure, very good looking figure. Um, got to be up there for me for one of the figures of last year. I'd say just off the figure. So it's um, it is one to get. Didn't you have the Jungle Express one? Jurassic Express, even. I've got I've got Jungle Boy, uh, in this style, but uh, I haven't got the two pack, and I didn't have you just saw Oh, all right. I thought you had the two pack. No, I could have sworn seen you pick up that two pack at some point. No, I, I think I tried, but someone had got in there before me. Yeah, it might be what I seen. Someone, that. someone that you two have blocked. So that's probably why. <laughs> all right, I haven't, I haven't blocked anyone. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I think someone someone swooped in there before I got in there. So, um, yeah, chance to. Um, and I also got the tag team pack of Kenny Omega and Adam Page, um, which I picked up on the Legion of Hasbro group. Um, yeah, it's actually a lot better than the box than I thought it was going to be. Yeah, I mean, do you not have the other the figures separately already? I actually don't. Um, but I've got these coming. Anyway, they're, they're coming loose, so I'm probably just going to keep this in the in the box, truth be told, and just let it, um... liar. I was going to say, truth be told, that'll be on eBay within about five days. It'll be you'll be selling oh. it one way or another. Yeah, I have no incentive to sell it. It's not worth it like, much, is it? It's not worth any less than I paid for it. Exactly. Well, it's but he's still going to sell for it. He's still going to sell it. Oh wait, well, I'll keep this. There's no reason to. I've no reason to sell this. And the other. Oh. The Adam Page that I have coming in is um, Series 2, so he's in his, his pants. 
rather than the uh, the tights. All right, so you're going to keep that then? I'm going to keep this. All right, we'll see. We'll see. I have no incentive to sell it. It's like it's, it's about thirty quid on eBay uh, on Amazon. Sorry, could be thirty quid in your pocket to spend on raffles. I paid thirty quid for it. There's, there's no no point we having it, is there? There isn't. You're right. There's no point you having it. Yeah, there's no point me buying it for thirty quid. Should have said for thirty quid. What's the point in that? No point everyone, was bang, everyone was banging on about how good a deal that was when you bought it. So if it's thirty quid on Amazon, how come that was happening? I don't know. Um, I was surprised. I, I, I think it's like 33 quid on Amazon, to be honest. I think you've just got buy interests on that group. We just they have to buy off people all the time. It's got to stay Especially relevant. If there's, a, yeah. if, there, if there's a certain wheel involved, you're definitely buying it, regardless of what the price you've is. You've got to stay relevant in these groups, Johnny. You've got to get your name out there, haven't you? Hey? Well, apparently you do. You, you do. You have to. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be keeping that anyway. Just like the code you set, which I'm keeping in this box. Um, I'll be keeping that as well. All right. Of course you are. Yeah. Um, oh, Adam, let's come across to you. Oh, you both finished? Or... Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, all I was going to show, um, we've obviously got the Fancy Wrestling League 2022, kicked off a couple of days ago before this recording. Um, so we've just put together the prizes for the end of season in the league. So this doesn't account for the 67 prizes we've also got for competitions, and it doesn't account for the sponsored business competitions. So even more prizes than that. So we're probably looking at almost 100 prizes this season, I reckon. Um, So these are the end of season prizes. I'll go through them quite quickly because, you know, there's like 10 of them or something. So we've got the... Limited edition Rob Van Dam number four raw draft figures. I always like these figures um, from my own collection. These are uh, I, I tried, but I'm not seeing them often enough to collect them as a as a set. So I've kind of given up. So I'll put that one in. There's our free text. I've got I've got a Maven one for some reason. I don't know why, but it's decent. Is that Maven one? It's quite a good body for him. That's right. Uh, the usual one for me. I don't know how I ended up with about eight of these figures um, but we've got the King Mabel figure from the SummerSlam <laughs> range got the Elite Rock series 81 good one that valuable I didn't come out of it did it Ray Phoenix from was the it fortune about six months ago <laughs> it was it's not anymore no nope. the usual one I think it's going to be in every season of this one uh, Retrofest Funky Tonk Man, definitely an underrated figure. That is starting to creep up in value, by the way. Yeah, I'm still not selling it on eBay, though. It's about six. <laughs> um, I am. The Samoa Joe yeah. Retro. That one's creeping up as well, Samoa Joe. The Flashback Ultimate Warrior with the belt. Nice. The Hall of Fame Million Dollar Man. Um, which I actually showed in the last podcast. And because I've got two, I decided to put one in. Definitely value there. That's, that's a... Yeah, we're getting... We're get, th- these two are the big boys. So a Million Dollar Man and then the Ultimate Edition Ric Flair figure, which Ultimate Editions always go up in value. So by the time this goes next year, it's probably going to be worth a, a pretty penny. Uh, on yep. top of that, we've also got TSM uh, have put up uh, a, a figure... Mm. Uh, that he's going to make for somebody so they can choose whatever okay. they want, whether it's themselves or whether it's a wrestler. That is amazing. It's, I think it's almost what I'm going to aim for this season. Me too. Oh, another one. But like, um, I'll try and finish second overall. <laughs> well, I was probably like, I really want what's another figure made of myself, but I've already got one. So, what, what would you guys get if you were like a, a chase? Street gear flashback? Uh-huh. I would probably maybe get something that I know companies aren't going to make. Maybe like a Chris Benoit or something. No. no I've, just, I've just ordered, ordered my next figure from Tom. Uh, I've given him a bit of a challenge. I've ordered a uh, Virgil, but in the striped trousers. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, yeah he's going to have fun with that bad boy. I think, um, I mean, that Owen Hart that you made for last year's uh, Chase the Belts. 
was incredible. I think I'd have to get that, I reckon. Yeah. Oh, actually, maybe a Jimmy Snooker could be the one in they, these category that are never going to get made as an elite. So. Mm. That if I did win that prize, that would be that would be the category of figure I'd choose. Someone that's never going to get one. No. It'd be Borger. Yeah. Maybe the um, Mustafa. Adnan, you mean? General yeah, Adnan. I forgot his name. Yeah, the one I won with Mustafa. Yeah, General, General Adnan. I wouldn't I'd completely quite, rule that one out. Be quite interested to see if TSM can uh, nail nails. Because I don't think I've ever seen a custom of nails that I've gone, oh, that's good. I've just got one. Do you want to see mine? Or have yeah, you seen go it? For it? I don't. I can't remember whether I've seen it or not. Imagine. Uh, is the face is the face perfect? Because everyone yeah. can do the body with nails, but the face never gets right. I think it looks all right. It's actually a cane face, I think. So I, I, it's hard it's to a tell. Good choice, actually. It, it, but he's kind of, the, the customizer is like sort of blacked out one of the teeth, so he's like, you know, toothless and a, a bit like, and um, molded the hair. I think it's getting a little bit sort of um, chipped in that throughout the, the years of having it. So, yeah, be interesting to see what they can do with what I can do with the 3D printer for the head and nails, then. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's obviously an Eric Rowan body, so yeah. Works so, well to be fair. It looks a bit like Dan Lambert. It's hard to tell with this. With this, I might try now and get you a picture sent over and we'll put it on over the top of has this. He got a, has he got a stubble cast? Yeah, yes, yes. Um, yeah, it's a, I think it's a bit rough around the edges. It's not like a, a Tom Jordan style figure. It's I don't think it's sealed properly with paint with the paint and stuff as well. So, but it does look all right from a distance. It's good enough for what it is. Um, well, let's move on to some retro review. No, I think we're all done. Yep. yep. Oh, good stuff then, boys. Well, I think Nails isn't in this series that we're covering, but uh, there's some absolute crackers in it anyway. So let's move on to retro review. R-E-T-R-O. Uh, retro review time, boys. Now we're looking at all the uh, Hasbro's we've been discussing on the Legion of Hasbro. We're on uh, Series 9, which has uh, come round quicker than a hiccup. Uh, Johnny, let's fire across to you. Yeah, as we completed Series 8 last time, I think what you could say about this series was it was good, very good overall. I think if you're going to average out the series, and um, it would be the, the best average series overall because I think there was um, 5 out of the 6 scored over 8.5 in, in a score. So. Um, very much the top boy in terms of average series, but the best one of them all was Yokozunas, came in at number eight. And um, also had Bret Hart, Mr. Perfect, and Bam Bam Beagle in the top 20. Yeah. So a good series overall. Yeah, as we move Bam on. Bam didn't score higher. It's quite toyetic, isn't it? Dane just had his flaws, didn't it? Mm-hmm. Right, let's move on to Series 9 then. We'll start with, with Doink, who's saying a nice hello to everyone with his big hand. And he's fist pumping action. Um, I love this figure. I think it's one as a kid that I've always really enjoyed. Um, even the hair, everything. And as an adult, I think my, my two-year-old loves the figure that I got for him um, of Doink. So, yeah. Very strange why uh, some of the comments will on Legion of Hasbro. Mainly Phil Rapley, which I've come to now, which says that this is what puts him off displaying Hasbro's. You may come around and say, oh, is that Ultimate Warrior? Nice. Oh, Hulk Hogan, I remember him. Oh, sweet, is it Undertaker? Wait, why is there a clown with fuzzy hair? And because of that, he's giving it a three. Yeah, I mean, it's not far wrong in my opinion, I don't think the hair makes it better. I think it makes it worse. I think if the hair was a, a plastic, it would have been better. Plus, it does get frayed. Mine's all over the place. I'm not sure how they look mint out of package. So, mine's just a bit too fuzzy at the moment. It's unique. I think that's my favourite thing about it, is that it's not like any other Hasbro. And Doink wasn't really like any other wrestler. Um, so, I think that's what I like about it. 
Yeah. Is the body completely unique? I'm not sure. Well, like the hair and just the general look of it. And it's proneness to broken fingers. And paint chips as well, because it's so colourful. Uh, I do think that it would have been better in a different colour scheme, maybe the, the blue and yellow, but I'm not sure if he wore it at this point, so I can't really critique it too much on that. Um, the face is good, but I don't know how you can mess up with Doink. And, yeah, some good paint issues. Could have maybe done more with the bottom half. I'm not sure, again, not sure what he wore at the time. I always remember the boots being yellow or something, though, not black. In, like, this attire. The childhood me hates this figure with a passion. Um, I just, uh, I always found it at Car Boots. I never got this one new. And, you know, the, the amount of flaws that you've got when you buy one of these from a Car Boot, the hair's cut. For some reason, kids liked cutting the hair. Um, of Doink, uh, like you say, with the fingers. I can understand why Hasbro did it like that, because it's the kind of mime aspects of Doink. So, you know, it makes perfect sense as an adult, but, you know, it damages the figure, yeah, and the shaky hand. Um, it damages the figure when you get it second hand, uh, which is all I did. Uh, I didn't like playing with it, really, because you could only use it as Doink, and I liked to use my figures as, like, loads of different people and stuff like that. And like you say, the, the attire is just, it's, it's not great. It's for doink, it's quite bland. It, it's not bland, but for doink, it's bland. Yeah. Uh, the adult in me can see how toyetic it is. We use the word quite a lot, but I also don't particularly like it. Uh, so, it's you know, I can't really go with anything there. It's just you when you see a doink. It's just a sad doink face. So, so yeah, Adam doesn't really like it. Jamie loves it. I don't really like it. I'll kick us off. 7.3. Um, 8.6 for me. Definitely um, going to go lower. Um, it's it's not a terrible figure, so it won't be really low, but it's a flat 6 for me. Wow. <laughs> Very different. And Legion Hasbro, I've scored a quite high, um, in fact, the highest of the, the whole of this series, and it's 8.41. Even with yeah. Phil's three in there. Even with Phil's three, without the three, God, might have been up a, a few more decimals there. That's that, Phil. Anyway, we'll move on. It's Hacksaw Jim Duggan. Version two comes with a, a singlet, USA singlet, and a lovely flag. The flag is a very nice accessory, actually. Your flag's bent, isn't it? Like a case fresh Hasbro. Um, yeah, I, th I think... This figure for me always reminds me of, um, well, it's always my favourite Hacksaw Jim Duggan figures, put it that way. People prefer the Series 2, but not for me. I think this, yeah, this one for me just is the best Hasbro uh, of the series, I think, personally. Um, we'll get to that in a second, but Adam. Yeah, I completely agree with you. This, this is the best Hacksaw for me. The other one is quite bland, even though it's more typical Hacksaw. Uh, this one I just absolutely loved seeing at Kai Boots and stuff like that. Uh, the hair is a weird colour, but I quite like it. Mm. Uh, you know, yeah. I don't know why, because it isn't his hair colour, but mm. I do think it works with the figure. It might just be the the, the comparison with the beard. Um, but I just think loads of effort went into this as far as the attire-wise goes and as far as the accessory-wise goes. Uh, it's a great, great Hasbro figure. Yeah, I don't have much to argue there. I would say the hair is good because he did, you know, dye his hair at this point in his career. He had more of a, a blonde look on his hair, so it's accurate in that respect. Yeah, I've got no real complaints, but I think it's really good. And the, the flag, I, I don't know, like you say it was bent, Jamie. I think they all kind of end up like this. I'm not sure how they are out of the... Oh, yeah, they do. Yeah. yeah, so... You had one recently, mint on card. So, how was the flag on that? Oh yeah, it's like when you have mint on card, it's like glued down essentially, isn't it? Yeah, it doesn't it really, um, yeah, it doesn't really do anything. It just sort of looks. You sort of see it's just behind them there, so you can't really see it. But, right. Yeah, that's what you mean. But yeah, I think yeah, hair color wise, I agree with Adam. It's um makes it stand out a bit more for me. 
it might not be a hundred percent accurate with like, the color tones with it, but at the same time, it's good enough and it's toyetic and it makes it more cartoonish, which I like. Certainly. Um, let's hear some comments and we'll move on. Um, Paul Montgomery. He's always one of the first. Um, prefer the earlier figure. Always felt this was a bit pointless, but like that mold and the likeness is okay too. He's given it a six and a half out of ten. Um, uh, Martin Harris has put eight. Big fan of this figure. Love the accessory and upgraded paintwork. Mm, contrasting. Um, I don't think it was pointless because of the, it was, you know, essentially a new attire for a popular character. It's very good. Um, anyway, average score, Legion has brought 8.09. So it's over that 8, but much old. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll reflect that. I think well, 8.3. Um, was what I was, was going to give it, and then I thought, yeah, I think it was, the hair colour for me, I think it just gives it a couple of extra points from what Adam was saying. I didn't really notice it that much. 8.7. Okay. Um, Adam? Yeah, one up from me, 8.8. Really enjoy this figure. Yeah. Hmm. I'm not sure myself. I think somewhere in between yours. I might even go break the old habit and do a double decimal point and say it 8.75. Oh, what? Are you allowed to do this? Is this oh. a rule? Some people have given double decimals in Legion Hasbro, so... They've been kicked out the since they have. <laughs> no, not quite. Anyway, let's move on to first half of the Steiner Brothers, it's Rick Steiner. Look at the Adam. designs on that. Apparently it's not completely accurate how it was, but I mean, the amount of detail that's in is still really good. I think the yeah. face is decent. It's always the one you wanted to get out of the Steiners, and I mean, value-wise nowadays, it is the one that's definitely worth the most. It stands out as far as the tag team goes. Uh, body shape is really good. Headgear really good. Face wise, because he's got quite a he's got quite a toyetic face anyway. Does that make sense? Mm, so yeah. it looks like him. It was always gonna look like him, no matter like if they went slightly wrong or not with it. Um, and the attire, like you say, is just you know they could have gone really plain and they didn't. So kudos to them. A very very good figure. Sometimes suffers from uh, bleaching of the skin tone. Yeah, maybe. Um, the one thing that was pointed out on, on the comments of Legion Hasbro was um, that he's got no white in his eyes. It's hard to see on, on my camera, but it's so no, no white in his eyes, apparently. Um, yeah, yeah I, th I Which, think to be honest, it oh, doesn't really affect it. I think singlet wise, it looks like sort of that early 90s era for me, which brings back a bit of nostalgia. Um, Reminiscent of like Saved by the Bell, for example, those sorts of like little flecks of, of colour and so on, if that makes any sense. But um, yeah, I'm really happy with how, how it turns out. One of those figures I always forget that they make. I uh, always forget that it exists, if I'm honest. So yeah, I'm glad that they've, they did actually make it. And the Steiner line as well. Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. This is actually what I think it happened is that it's a complete repaint of Demolition Smash. Because I can feel the, the bumps where oh, the crush, just demolition crush, demolition crush. Maybe then. Um, I think it was one of the questions on the last quiz. Yeah, demolition crush. Sorry about that. You're right. Um, so it has the bumpy bits of the the studs on on the on the trunks. I didn't feel. It's just. Well, that's going to mark it down for me now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just the bottom half that is um, crush apparently. Yeah, um, it might, it might be the top half yeah, as well. Yeah. Obviously, because he would have had the yeah. straps. Um, so yeah, uh, LOH Bruce Connolly has put uh, eight. I'd give it more, but it's a, but a job to stand him up at times. Apparently, it's quite hard to stand up. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, I remember that from being a kid. And Adam Mugridge has put almost gave this a nine, but Bruce above has commented about standing him up. I agree. Drops him down to an eight point five. Uh, that's what this is about, isn't it? It's about finding out things about figures that you didn't understand or didn't even realise that other collectors get annoyed about, really. 
Yeah, I've had no issues with them standing up, but you have to kind of like make sure you balance it exactly right, put them down gently. As he needs. Um, yeah, for me, it's a 7.4. I'll go with Toy Egg. Um, but I think, yeah, there's that bottom half laziness of, of keeping in the crush. Hmm. It's gone down for me since uh, since I came into this podcast, unfortunately, finding out two things uh, and remembering about the fact that he fell over all the time, which he did when I was a kid. Um, mm. Takes it down, not as low as Jamie, takes it down to an 8.3. Yeah, and um, for me, I, I think it's the best of the series, so I'm going to have to give it more than Hacksaw, but not too much more, 8.8. As we move on to Scotty Steiner. Of course, we won the rest as I looked forward to seeing the most out of almost anyone back in the 90s when he was in this sort of Steiner Brothers era. Just thought he was so exciting. The moves he did were so innovative. And oh, yeah. So it's different because also I um, didn't really watch WCW that much. So it went from having this figure and seeing Steiner in the early 90s to then I think it had the Toy Biz figure to then seeing him in WWE in 2002, where he was just absolutely massive. Yeah, um, yeah, quite a big contrast, but figure wise, love the mallet, love the attire, it's great. Yeah, it's it's face wise, I would say this is one of the best Hasbro's because I do think it genuinely looks like him. Um, not in not in just because they you know he had a unique face anyway, he didn't have a unique face at this point, and they have got it exactly right near enough. Um, they've gone with the effort again, same as uh, same as Rick. Obviously, a half half effort, which I don't blame him. Uh, and the kind of right body for him with the kind of suplexness of it, uh, how the moves that he did at the time, you can kind of pull off a Frankensteiner kind of with this. He's got his legs just about wide open enough to try that. Uh, it's a really good figure. Yeah, I'm a bit somewhere in between it being a good figure and. Maybe it's because of the value and perceived sort of perception of it. I don't recall the attire being worn, but obviously I didn't see every single Steiner Brothers match. Um, I don't know. It feels like it's missing something, and I'm not super sold on the face like you are. But still good overall. Um, Sean Cold has put, I don't know that's his real name, uh, six, <laughs> not, a bad, but not a big fan of his gear. No, yeah, I'd see what he means. I guess. Um, others have sort of gone with like the, the simple side of things. Patrick Ayres has scored at 33.3 because of the uh, Scott Steiner promo. He then came back and gave it a proper score. Um, but yeah, I think I, all in all, I think figure-wise, it's, it's great and better than Rick Steiner for me, just based off the bottom half. Uh, solid eight for me. Said no one ever, I don't think, about you know being better than Rick. We'll, we'll see. What, what I prefer it to Rick. I prefer it to Rick. I think I do. I don't know why, but I just do. Yeah. So I, ha- I had Rick slightly higher um, when I came into it, but obviously uh, he lost a couple of marks. Um, I think I'm going to go 8.5. I think I slightly prefer Steiner as an adult. Steiner, the both Steiner. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, stranger things have happened there, but you scoring Scott higher than Rick's very against the grain. Uh, Lady Jean Hasbro scored it 7.63, so it's down quite a bit from Rick. And also for me, it's down a full point, it's 7.8. So I do definitely rate Rick better than Scotty. Still, uh, still a good score. Yeah. Um, so next we go on to the final edition of The Million Dollar Man. This is the last one we're doing the series. We're not doing Tatanka because we've already reviewed the same figure before. There he is in his wrestling attire this time. No suit. Um, has the million dollar sign on both sides and on the boot, but very, very faint, which is a problem with any sort of figure that's had gold in it. We've seen mm. Riz Ramon and etc. The gold does fade quite easily. Um, quite a hard one for the skin tone to match up with different body parts. The head, the body, the arms and the legs. It's quite rare and quite hard to find. You're all, they're all the same colour. Yeah. 
definitely. Um, I, I don't really enjoy this sort of style of figure, if I'm honest. I don't know why they didn't use the, the Macho Man type body rather than this one. They're going to do a, a ring attire Ted DiBiase. Um, the face is... He did, he did probably... punch quite a lot, didn't he? Yeah, he did, he did his little, like... Yeah, yeah. He, he did punch. Well, everyone punches. <laughs> Well, he has a, he's like a special kind of punch. I know it's got a word, but it's a different punch to yeah. other people. It was a signature punch. Mm. He did a signature, like, sort of fist drop on the ground as a opponent, but I don't well, remember any signature punches. That would work for that. Um, of course, yeah. Actually, you got a point, like, because he sort of went down, as you can see, like this. Mm. So, so, yeah, maybe it represents the fist drop rather than an actual punch, which has kind of made me feel a little bit better about the action. So, congrats, guys. Yeah. Uh, well, George Moran has put, I'd give this a seven. He at least did a few punches. The action is good for me. And the attire is pretty much spot on. The head tilt on the million dollar Hasbro for me is perfect, just like some, some of his promos looking smug. Um, yeah. For me, I think it's. A needed one, maybe a bit earlier, might have been better, but um, yeah, six point, sorry, seven point six for me. Yeah, um, I, I think it's just like one of those figures that's quite good. I think I do stand by. I think it could be a bit better to action if it was a macho man, but the face is good. It's a bland figure. You've sold me a bit more on the action, so it's a seven straight. I really like having this figure with Money Inc. So putting it with IRS, I think it works. If I think of Money Inc., I think of Ted just plain like he is in this figure. Um, so I think it works a little bit later on uh, in career-wise. Um, yeah, but I can see the blandness. Uh, 7.3. Uh, Leeds has will definitely seen the blandness and score it way lower than us at 6.58 overall for the lower of the series. Which if we, if we didn't have the suited Ted's, then I don't think we'd, then we'd score that low. But then what can you say? Um, we have got them, so it's just smile and crack on. Okay, <laughs> and crack on we shall. And we move on to the retro review, and obviously, series 10 in the next episode of Hasbro as well. So, um, yeah, brilliant. Let's move on to the uh, break it down segment, boys. Break it down. One of the most nostalgia-filled Royal Rumbles and star-sided Rumbles um, that we've ever seen, in my opinion. The Rumble 1982 was uh, the mainstay of anyone's VHS collection, um, or if you went to Blockbuster, always the one that I used to pick up from the shelf on a Friday night. Um, boys, sort of 1982, this is the prime golden era for wrestling, in my opinion. Um, did you guys have this as a, as a kid, Johnny? Um, I, I think I actually had the Sky at the time and recorded it so i had to watch a few you know weeks or months after that so i did see it a few times around around that time but ne never really kept it forever it must have got taken over or something but yeah I, I did see it at the time surprisingly yeah one of those weird events for me because as a kid i didn't really connect with rick flair he was a bit boring for me um but look at this this rumble just was amazing, even as a kid. Absolutely loved it. Usually something like that would put you off, but didn't at all with me. Spoilers, Adam. Spoilers. Spoilers. Um, in a dark match before the match, Chris Walker beat the Brooklyn Brawler. Well, that's qualification, just in case anyone was uh, wondering or cared about that. Um, commentary team, Gorilla Monsoon and Bobby Heenan. Um, the, probably the best duo for me, if you're taking Jesse Ventura out of the mix. Um, did a great job on commentary throughout as well. Yeah, it's like going one that was Hall of Fame performances, really, isn't it? Like, if you want to say what was the best commentary performance of an event ever, you'd, you'd have to put this one way up there or even a shoe in at number one. So, mm. absolutely brilliant commentary throughout. Yeah, the best. Yeah, it's definitely the com in the conversation, isn't it? Without a doubt, it's. It's up there, just from Bobby Heenan being Bobby Heenan and just back in the, the hills to Graham Monsoon just being the perfect um, play-by-play. -play. So, what could you want? Um, 
So yeah, in the undercard, the new foundation kicked the show off, Jim Neidhart and, and Owen Hart. Um, Faced the Orient Express of Kato and Pat Tanaka. Um, good action, good high fine action. Got the crowd going early um, for this for this match. I think Owen Hart and and Anvil would work very well together. Very toyetic outfits as well. So um, I don't have any thoughts on this match. Yeah, they knew how to work the crowd. Um, the crowd was slightly bland to start with, to be honest. Um, but they knew how to work. I mean, obviously, you've got the dastardly, the dastardly non-Americans uh, for the heels, which which is really good. Uh, I didn't recollect New, uh, New Foundation's music until I watched this again, and it's absolutely terrible. Really bland, rubbish music. Uh, that was that was the most I took out of this one. Yeah, the music was rubbish. Um... I thought this was very disappointing, actually, for the people that were in it. And if you're going to compare it with something, you could compare it with the match a year before that the Orient Express had with the Rockers, which was excellent, really, really good. But this one was really not anywhere near that one. So you'd expect more from them, I think. Especially with 17 minutes that this match was on for. Yeah, yeah, it wasn't. All the impressed. Owen did some good spots, but other than that, it was very lackluster, unfortunately. One thing I thought was um, quite interesting while I was watching this was how, in thirty odd years, thirty plus years, I think it's forty years, the format the format for a tag team match has not changed at all. But it's still relevant, if that makes sense. What do you mean? Well, yeah, explain. So. The, the, the heels would beat up the baby face. It'll, that will go on for the majority of the match. They'll corner one, then they'll get the hot oh. and then that will then come in and that will be the match. That has not changed. Yeah, that has not changed whatsoever. Uh, gone up to the recent day one pay-per-view, where it was this very similar um, thing. So, I, And I think it's still fresh, which is very strange. I mean, depending on how long the match is, you might get, you know, you've you got your shiner first, which is where the baby face get the shit in and then obviously that comes off to a cut off spot which gets the heels in control which called then you go into the heat then you may have half spots where you know um the the baby faces get back into it but then they get cut off again and then obviously you get your comeback and then finish so very this is basic sort of um match psychology or planning that you learn in wrestling school in your first couple of weeks to be honest but the longer the matches, you more get you might get more cut off points, you might get more um half spots, etc. etc. So false finishes, wherever, get added to the mix as well. And that last little bit where all rules get thrown out the window and um tags aren't needed. Um AEW. And there was a good a bit of flashback to when the Mountie beat um Bret Hart to win the IC title. That then rolled into the Roddy Piper versus the Mountie IC title match. Um, the reason I mentioned the time of the press, sorry, the new foundation winning being 17 minutes, there's the IC title match here, and he got five minutes, which is very strange. But all in all, I think Roddy Piper knew how to work the crowd again. Um, very good as, as a baby face as well as a heel. Um, Jimmy Hart was also quite good on the outside, but yeah, very, very, very good, compact action in five minutes. Uh, Adam, I realise why I hate Piper when I watch this whole show. Not just his match Rumble as well. Just I don't like his selling. I just don't like it. He's over the top. And even as a kid, I was just like, "What's he doing?" Like, there's no need for the kind of actions. I know people love him for that, but there's just no need for the over the topness that he goes on. And I, I didn't enjoy the match, to be honest. No, I agree. Um... To be honest, I people rate Piper as the talker, and I really don't. And in fact, I'd probably rate his in-ring work better than his mic work, which is really strange for someone to hear, but I can't listen to him talk. He talks absolute nonsense. Um, some parts of his matches I quite like in terms of the unorthodox nature of his um, strikes or even moves. But you're right about selling. That's just ridiculous over the top. Um, and the finish felt really flat. It looked like Jimmy Hart was going to interfere, but then he never did. So yeah. I don't know. And I know exactly. What you mean. I even watched it back the other day, and I thought, oh, there we go. It's going to be a DQ for it. I think I knew the outcome anyway, but they're yeah, very strange why they didn't um, go through with that. Um, 
Next up, the tag match of the Beverly Brothers um, with the Genius, who, by the way, I think if the Genius was around nowadays, it'd be quite a good little gimmick. I'm surprised it didn't get more of a more of a push. Um, and they they beat the Bushwhackers uh, with Jameson, who I forgot it even existed. Um, Johnny, who are thoughts on this tag match? Yeah, um, the more we forget Jameson existed, the better. The, the only good part about this match, I think, was a bit of a, a good comeback by Bushwhacker Butch. thought he had to show some good fire, um, but not much great action. And the Beverly Brothers didn't even use their awesome theme music in the version I watched. I'm not sure if that was a network thing or whether they had the, a first version of this their song. I always love watching the Beverly Brothers. The Beverly Brothers are really nice, clean, crisp wrestlers, apart from when they dropped someone on the head one time yeah. uh, in that quite famous incident. Um, but yeah, they're always clean. I'm going to completely, completely disagree with you two on Jameson in this one. Um, Jameson for that time was perfect. You look at the kind of early 90s kind of characters on TV, you kind of screech, Saved by the Bell type of character. Um, and he's just perfect. I thought he really, really worked in this match. And he worked the crowd more than anyone else in that match. Um, I actually really enjoyed that this match. I'm not a fan of the Bushwhackers, to be honest. The kid of me was, but I'm not a fan now of the Bushwhackers. But I really enjoyed this match, and I like the Beverly Brothers. I didn't, um, I didn't say anything bad about James, so I forgot he existed, um, which I did. I remember him as a kid chewing the tie. I wasn't a massive fan of him, but I, I, I take your point. Not for me, still. You haven't convinced me. Um, in between that, there was a nice little promo from uh, LOD, which I think one of the most nostalgic things around this time is when Hawk cuts a promo and there's that initial, well, um, which I always used to like. So, um, yeah, I thought that was really good. Sort of That's the worst talk impression I've ever heard. Well, I can't. I can't <laughs> the, uh, the grass. Well! Yeah, that one. That, that wasn't that much better. <laughs> but um, yeah, I thought that was quite good. Um, and the one thing I will say about it, though, at the start of the match, I think it was either Heenan or Monsoon said about the champion's advantage, said about countouts, and that sort of yep. gave it away a little bit for me. Yeah. Um... One aspect of wrestling, which I don't understand until this very day, is why more people, especially heels, don't try to win by count out. A win's a win, it, and I don't even understand why there's this daft old rule where titles don't change hands on count outs and DQs, because they do in terms of, if you watch a MMA fight, for instance, if there's a disqualification for whatever reason, that would mean the other guy wins and wins the title. Why not in wrestling? Um, yeah, if I was running my own promotion, I, I'd, I'd put those rules straight in and I'd probably book a lot more matches to finish by intentional count out. For the berserker, this finishing move, yeah, yeah, exactly. They used to do quite a lot of spots. They went through a phase where a wrestler would walk up the ramp to try and get away, and then somebody would come out and stop them. They do seem to have stopped that quite a lot now. Uh, I mean, that, that that prevents the need to sort of make the win mean something and you get that win however possible, even if it's by coming out. Even, right, let's just go back to day one. Did you watch day one? There's a time where it, I think it was a Miz and Edge match and um, it looked like Miz was going to try and get a count out victory, but the referee just stopped counting at eight, probably because he knew Edge couldn't get back in or it was part of the plan of the match that Miz was going to go back out and you know, attack him more. Um, why didn't Miz just take the win by DQ? I'm sorry, count out. I know what you mean. It'd be quite good to have like a thing where someone throws him over the rope and then just stands inside the ring and tries to block him from getting back in or something. Yeah, I mean, that could work, but yeah. just have some sort of incapacitating move on the outside. Like these dives that you see in the AEW all the time, what's the point of doing that if you're not going to win the match from it? You could do an amazing dive, knock someone out, get yourself back in the ring, win by count out. Then it will mean something. I used to do it on the wrestling in the, game. In the fans' eyes, do they not almost seem that see that as kind of cowardice and weakness? Yeah, it's because they've been conditioned for that to be the case. Mm. Um, if you can condition the audience to to feel differently about a count out win, it will would 
in fact, just to feel differently about winning in general, especially WWE, because people intentionally get DQ'd all the time, or it's almost like they don't really care about winning because there's no stakes. So if, if they don't care about winning, why should the audience? I think the one person to make, to, if someone was going to bring that to light, I think MJF would probably be the best person to bring that into light. Um, if, he ever, if he ever becomes champion, I think having that, little storyline I think would be quite good but it, what I'm saying is um, are, are you saying that you want MGF to intentionally lose a match to keep the belt or are you saying you you want to win by yes. out to take the... there's a number one contendership match or the Dynamite Diamond Ring for example and Wardlow keeps the guy on the outside that could do it and as well as the if he's a champion and he's facing someone that he doesn't think he can beat winning by Losing by count out or or DQ or something could work. No, we don't want to lose by count out. We want to win by count out. Yeah, I know what you mean. Right. And this is this is my wrestling philosophy, and we need to really talk about the natural disasters LOD match. Yeah, well, the, the natural disasters had a good promo afterwards, which made a lot of sense. And I think it's always good when a heel makes a lot of sense, which I quite liked. And they were right. They should have won the belt. They won the match. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, but our match in total was solid. Uh, good workers in the ring. Uh, Earthquake's a big old boy, isn't he? You know how much of a big old boy is until you see him up close next to next Typhoon looks small. I think the main thing I took, main thing I took from this match was sometimes it's easy to forget how good a wrestler uh, Fred Ottman is. Uh, he was very good in the uh, like the first five minutes of this match, especially. He was very good, very clean, very. Smooth. I used it for Beverly Brothers as well. Um, I'm not a big LOD fan. I don't, I don't enjoy their matches, if I'm completely honest with you. I find them sloppy, messy, and just all about them. Um, so disasters, you know, first five minutes, they, they did well for themselves. Yeah, you see in like, LOD matches are all about them, but I think they had quite a lot of offense. Sorry, the disaster had quite a lot of offense on, on Hawk. Um, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying about this particular match. Is uh, I did enjoy it more than I, the usual LOD match. Well, yeah, that's a sorry, seven-year-old me remembered that Hawk got beaten up quite a bit in the match. I just think it was weak. Well, that little bit of tidbit there just ruined my intro to the Rumble. Just that, just. Of course. <laughs> um, yeah, one thing I didn't mention at the start was, um, do you remember the bit of the, uh, the start of the Rumble, the whole pay-per-view, where the little stars come across and it's got a picture and Vince McMahon does his best uh, yep. entrance to it. Um, that brought back a lot of recently, which was really good. Yeah, I absolutely love that. Yeah, and, and the artwork as well for the actual Rumble itself. And um, the poster, iconic. Um, and then the little promos. Yeah. All of it, all of it was just perfect. I think they should do the promos and bring them back, I think. Um, for some yeah. people, no one wants what Angel Garza doing, that sort of thing. But, um, Probably shouldn't have had British Bulldog do it either. Um, oh. Royal Albert Hall, my hometown. Yeah, I was going to mention Yorkshire that. Accent. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, in his hometown of London, England. Mm. Um, you probably know where I'll see. Um, Right, so yeah, doing the British Bulldog, he came out first. Um, he did. Which I think is always a good one to bring the Bulldog out first. I always, always like, because he's got a bit of a tank on him, is not he? He could go the distance if needs be, as evident for a later rumble. Um, and Ted DiBiase came out second as well, which, um, to be fair, but for the times, there were quite big hitters to come out first and second. I think for the previous rumble, the previous years, there haven't been that many big hitters out this early. Um, not, not like, not, not as big as those two, I don't think. Not at that time. We had a brat that came out first and uh, and second, I think, for a later year. But he wasn't that big at the time. Whereas compared to Dibiase and Bulldog, who were upper mid carders, um, you, you could say they were both contenders as well for this one. Yeah, I think that was the thing as well. The majority of people in this one were contenders. Um, I think well, with majority. No, a majority out of ten. <laughs> Six or seven, should we say, when we were, were, were contenders. Um, Jerry Sags doesn't win anything, does he? So for the first two, Bulldog, like you say, is the perfect choice for first. 
Um, we all know that he's not the best technically, um, but this particular match doesn't need that. So for him to come out first and deliver 900 million clotheslines and stuff like that, perfect choice. I didn't actually like Ted coming out second. Yes, they couldn't repeat what they'd already done about him buying the later spot, but to actually come out second when he's still got that kind of character about buying off things. Uh, I don't know. I just thought he could have come out midway and it wouldn't have been an issue because the commentators had to mention it. Gorilla Monsoon said, oh, he's not bought his spot this year. And I, I just don't think it needed to be even mentioned because it ruined his character a tiny little bit with it. Well, he came out first in 1990 as well. So Did he? Not the first time he's started the, the Rumble match. Um, Surprised he went out so well. I thought, you know, if you're going to put someone there and have them go on quite a, quite a while like the Bulldog did, but obviously wanting the Bulldog to shine a bit and get a bit of um, MV Flair coming up next. Um, yeah, Flair coming third. Um, once again, from the outset, commentary team did really well to to put him over. And um, yeah, I think he felt like a big deal when he came out. I think one yeah. thing I loved about this that they don't do nowadays is the, I hope we discussed it at last one, but the entrance... Um, no music whatsoever, which is absolutely perfect for this rumble. Um, to come out and you get that nice little pop when they walk through the curtain, I thought that was really good. The buzzer. Yeah. The one thing I, one thing I hate about this is the the um, wow. the network presentation of it and the Coliseum video. Um, them giving away him coming out third, and then the Heenan commentary loses that tiny little bit. Cause the Heenan commentary is perfect. And it loses that tiny bit with him having the home video bit announcing his third. Yeah, I can see what you're saying, but if you've seen it at the time, you've obviously never seen that interview. And if you've watching it again, you know he comes out third, you know the story. Has, well, so... People who haven't seen it will watch that for the first time and it won't quite be the same. Which bit are you on about, sorry? Uh, a... just, just before the Rumble started, there's the Coliseum home video exclusive where Fleur reveals his third. Oh, right, okay. Um, same yeah. with the, yeah, because Hogan did one as well, didn't he, earlier in the um, the thing where um, the home Coliseum video came out. But I think, I think they showed them after the VHS, am I right? I think they were on after. But I know what you mean. If if they showed that on the network and you're showing your 10 year old for the first yeah. time, just lose its bit of uh, je ne sais quoi. I think. Yeah. Um, yeah, next up, we've got some jobbers coming in. Um, so Sags and Haku. Um, come in. I was hope, hope Hacker wasn't watching here and we called him a jobber, but um, Bulldog made sort of light work of those, didn't he? Just to sort of carry that on. Yeah, not much to add. A lot of the sags. A lot like um, one thing to mention is when Haku came in, they did start doing heel versus heel uh, in terms of Haku attack and flair, and they almost seemed like if there was more heels in the ring. Other heels would go after Flair, and he almost became a tweener all like most of the way through it, where it was the faces and the heels attacking him, but there wouldn't be other heels versus heels necessarily. I think so, yeah. that works well in the sense of like the tagline for it was every man for himself, and I think it helped with like the commentary sound bites of just um, explaining and getting over the fact that it's every man for himself. Um, so I, th- I think it worked well in that respect of like. Everyone's going to, regardless of heels and faces and so on, they're going to attack. Everyone's trying to try and win the bell. Yeah, I mean, it's not the point I was making. I was more making the point that heels had a more tendency to go after Flair than any other heel. Right. To make him, you know, give him a sort of baby face aspect to his run in this match. Yeah, I mean, maybe we did it for the big pop at the end, maybe. I don't know. I think they probably knew that Heenan would be very Fleur orientated in the commentary as well. So the more they went after Fleur, the more they'd kind of get a mention and that would become apparent. Mm. Maybe. Um, Phil Michaels was in next, which um, one thing I forgot to mention earlier was obviously, I, I remember as a kid, the barbershop moment with Marty Jannetty. It's the first time I saw it was on the VHS of, of the Rumble 92. I think it was the week before, wasn't it? So I always thought for ages that this is where they broke up was at the Rumble 92 because it was just before. But um, this is the sort of start of, of HBK's um, sort of singles run, really, wasn't it? Yep. Or as he would say, I don't think so, which is a catchphrase he was desperately trying to get over at that point. 
Yeah. It didn't work. Um, it didn't. <laughs> but uh, yeah, he came in and then followed by Tito Santana or El Matador. Um, as was known at the time. Um, so he was quite good. They both chucked each other out, which is always always good to see. Yeah. Always leads to a mania match. Yeah. <laughs> Always does, but I quite like. I quite like the, when they use the rumble to set up a mania match. They don't do as much as they used to as they did. And I they, think it's all creative. Yeah, but they they primed it around the early two thousands, didn't they? Two thousand three, two thousand four, they primed that. Yeah. <laughs> um, Barbarian uh, come in next. Um, who was sort of th- tossed out by Hercules, which is always. Weird to see, but he lost. Oh, getting ahead of yourself, boy. Yeah, he lasted <laughs> way ahead of yourself for um for the barbarian. I think he lasted quite a long time for someone. Lasted ages. You made it sound like he just came in and went out. Mm, Bushwhacker Luke style. Um, yeah, I was very surprised how uh, how long he lasted. Big old dude. Was that around the time where everyone was getting hoyed out left, right, and centre? Was this coming up a bit? Yeah, who's it next? Was, it was near the time where Flo got left on his own. Mm. Yeah, that sort of a few minutes, wasn't there, where everyone just got thrown over. Um, Texas Tornado come in next. To, uh, I, thought, I thought that his promo before the match, I think he had me thinking, even though like, back in the day, this guy could win it, because I think he was quite hot on his game at the time, wasn't he? Um, so for me, he was one of those sort of loose outsiders, I think I'd say. But um, looking back at it, he had no chance. Yeah, maybe by perception from your end, see, I had a chance, but I think it was going through a lot of issues at that point, as we found out the following year. So he was I on quite, the top of the game. I did quite like how um, he kind of bypassed everyone and went straight to Fleur. Um, it was kind of nod to late 80s, mid 80s uh, territories, which as an adult I enjoyed. Um, Repo Man was in next, which um, I, I really enjoy Repo Man's appearance in this one, if I'm honest. I thought it was quite a good little uh, little breakup of the match, little cartoon character in there. I thought it was quite good. Sneaking around like he's a robber. Mm. But he's not. I will, I will second that, though. I enjoyed Repo in this rumble. He eliminated two people as well. Mm. Um, very strange. Yeah, but yeah, I know what you mean. He's not, he's not a robber. He's just a, a beta to her job. Um, Greg Valentine was in number 11. Uh, we've gone from cartoon character to Greg Valentine, which is quite a fault from Grace. But, um, and then Nikolai Volkov coming afterwards, which we're getting around that time you mentioned a second ago, Adam, um, with the um, sort of people just flooding in now and the ring starting to fill up, which is my favourite bit to the Rumble. I love those bits. Well, I'd, I'd say Valentine had the biggest pop um, so far out of everyone that had come in. I had a really loud pop when he came in. Nikolai was strange in this rumble, really strange. I don't know if he was just out of shape or I don't know if he was a last-minute induction or what. Mm-hmm. He just didn't look like he should be there. Um, I don't know if you saw some interaction with Barbarian because um, that's who Nikolai spent most of his minute or whatever he was in with. Barbarian no-sold everything that Nikolai threw at him. Uh, it was a very strange appearance by Nikolai. I didn't quite get it. He wasn't a replacement. I think Haku was as well, but I didn't catch on commentary who Gorilla said they both replaced. So I, I don't know if there's any information in front of you, Jamie, that says there were those guys replaced anyone in particular. But there were replacements. I do remember that being said. Nothing's coming up at all for it. Um, I don't know what you mean, though. I think, it, was, it, was it mentioned throughout the show? There was something... But it some... was mentioned that those two were replacements, but I can't, I, I don't recall, I didn't hear who they replaced. Some people will know. What if someone has been released or something? You know, warrior. Uh, I don't know if you noticed in the commentary as well. Um, Heenan said he was Lithuanian, followed straight away by Monsoon saying he was Russian. <laughs> well, uh, I think he claims to both at the point. It was a turnover point for Russia, wasn't it? Um, boss man come in next um, quite a short showing for Big Boss Man I thought but you guys might disagree on this but I think he deserves a, a bigger appearance in the match personally <coughs> he did get a short he appearance but he, he, sorry he did get a bit of a good shine but against Ric Flair for a, a minute so he, he looked alright still yeah I was going to say you can you can argue both with that 
Um, because yes, I think he only lasted officially like two people's worth. But when he came in, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people went out before him. So you, you see both sides of it. Um, boss man lasted three minutes and 38 seconds. Hmm. Which is, um, yeah, not long at all for someone, I think, of his position on the card anyway. He got, he got two people out. Yeah, I'll tell you that. Um, one of those people was Hercules, who came in just after him. Um, just around the sort of time when people have just been yeah, tossed out left, right, and center, and the, the rumble starts to break down, normally around the mid, the mid midway point. So, um, good to see it. My favorite, so before my favorite bit of the rumble is when it's full up, and then just everyone just gets shit canned over the ropes. Bossman's exit was terrible, mm-hmm. terrible, just like threw himself, and he was really far away from the ropes when he threw himself. Uh, and it just looked awkward and weird. I enjoyed it to be honest, but it just looked awkward and weird. Yeah, he didn't quite make it, so yeah, he just kind of threw himself over. There was the worst kind of eliminations, I think. Um, when someone's running at someone and they duck and grab the ropes, um, the women of wrestling at the moment do it the worst I've ever seen, I think. Nia Jax did a terrible one recently. Um, Roddy Piper came in next. Um, the second appearance of the night, coming in the midway point, got quite a big pop again and um, had a good little good little run on, on Flair, didn't he? I think the commentary team made you think Piper could go on to win this because of the Intercontinental Championship win and the fact that he could make history by winning both belts in one night. So he was probably up there in terms of favourites and they made a good point of making us think that he could make it and, and win it. Yeah. And I think one thing that this needed, which was perfect timing, was bringing Jake Robertson. I think he was the best, best person to bring in just after Piper. Just sort of slows it down a bit, just brings Piper down to, he's got a big energetic burst, just sort of bringing him down and, and just puts Jake over as well as a, as a good tactical heel. I really like that bit. Yeah, perfect place for joke. And on the lookout for Savage all the time, looking behind yeah. his back. Yeah. Like uh, that. There was uh, a fantastic bit of commentary at this point as well, where um, Heenan started really getting on Piper's side and was like, it's not a skirt, it's a kilt, it's a kilt. Yeah. And then the, mo- the moment that Piper went for Fleur completely changed it. He's wearing a skirt. It's just amazing. Best bit of the commentary of the Rumble. He did that a lot through all, which was perfect. He should have done. He kept doing it. I think he did with Shawn Michaels as well. When Shawn attacked Flair, but then held Flair. So, yeah. Did that a lot. Yes. Really good all round, wasn't it? Uh, Jim Duggan come in next. And see, he, um, I think with, with Jim, it was a very, he lost a good amount of time. Um, especially when he's, well, he came in quite late for the Rumble win that he did have in 88, but I think it's always good to have the previous winners in there just because you sort of people put them over as a Rumble specialist essentially once you win one, don't they? So it's a good bit of uh, a bit of placement as well for our gym. Right. Uh, RS coming next, who, um, yeah, really good showing actually. I was very surprised. Mm-hmm. I was quite a big IRS fan, wouldn't you say? Yeah, I mean, it lasted ages. Um, you know, you, I, I've mentioned it about three times in this pub, but you talk about smooth wrestlers. You don't get much smoother than Rotunda uh, with the moves that he does. And he, he just looked like he should be there um, to say he was a kind of probably lower to... I mean, he was just coming in it, so mid cardish at the time. Um, it was before his run with Ted. Um, he probably shouldn't have lasted quite as long as he did. But yeah, really good showing. Yeah, you shouldn't really put the sweatiest man alive in for that long in the rumble, should you? Especially in full clothing as well. Shout and <laughs> Sorry. Um Snooker coming next. It was yeah, very um very weird place for me on the card, uh, for him to come in. I sort of feel that he just come in just to be a body personally. Um plus his friends with McMahon, as they say it was. However, did you notice that it is is Mattel Legends elite figure yeah. attire? I mentioned that. Uh, I did. I was going to mention the figures side of things, and there's a lot of these the entrants have Mattel figures or even Hasbro's as well, which is yeah. I did notice that as well. Yeah. But um, specifically, Snooker because it was such a bad choice by Mattel. Yeah. 
Uh, Taker he, comes. He was in just get thrown out by Taker, wasn't he? Yeah, I was going to say that's literally it. Um, Taker coming next, who um, had a good had a good show, and I thought he was one of the ones that could potentially have, have, have won it as well for that time because he was not long off the um, title win, was he? So, yeah, exactly. Um, Probably would say his second favorite to be honest behind Hogan because of the the the, the title issues between him and Hogan. That's the reason why it's been held up. So. Yeah, yeah. Savage coming next made a beeline for uh for our Jake, didn't he? And um, he went and he went and hid though, didn't he? Mm. Which uh, Do you hear that? Bloody the quality rumble moment. Mm. Yeah. Um. Yeah, really good. I thought he had a really good entrance, really sort of good, lively opening for it, and settled into the match quite well afterwards as well. And for the match man, he always stands out in the crowd in the ring, so you can always pick him out quite easily, which I quite like about it. Well, he settled himself after he eliminated himself. <laughs> yeah. Which, uh, once again, I thought was one of the most iconic wrestling moments, isn't it? Uh, I think at that point, only, back in, only Andre. Back in. Like, how come Macho Man wasn't eliminated, but Big Boss Man was? I know you have the sort of saying that he eliminated himself, so it doesn't count type thing, but so did Big Boss Man. Well, Andre so. from 89. Yeah, yeah. Um, both involved the snake, but yeah, very strange. I think even didn't Bobby mention so much to do with this as well. I think Macho Man pretty much just wasn't thinking and did his normal exit of the ring. I remember being fuming as a kid. I was fuming that he was allowed to get back in, even though I was like a quite a fan of Macho Man. I was like, it's, it's against the rules. This is what's happening. Yeah, no re- account for the rules. My favourite person eliminated from the Rumble was Berserker um, for this one. It's my favourite elimination for the whole thing. Um, I think I had a really good elimination. It was quite, well, it was, it was Toy Egg back in the day, but it was quite a standout character for someone that didn't really do much. He's I good for him. a Rumble, isn't he? Yeah. Should have won it. <laughs> uh, and Virgil came out next. Um yeah, he, he didn't last overly long, I didn't think. Um, personally, but I think Virgil-wise, for, once again, he was quite a jobber at this point, wasn't he? He wasn't like a big mainstay. Um, well, after his feud with Ted, I guess. But mm. He was on his way down at this point. Yeah. Definitely. Um, Mustafa came in after Virgil as well, just sort of fill out that weird dynamic between 20 and 25, just fill that out. Um yeah, do with his best bushwhacker impersonation on the weirdo. <laughs> uh, Rick Martel come in 25th as well after his brilliant showing that he had uh, a few years earlier. Um, the sort of more my, my thing I always associate Rick Martel with is his attire, so I was quite glad that he wore it for this. Bring back those nostalgia buttons from Paul Rick as well. Um, What's a Royal Rumble without Rick Martel? Exactly. Um, a terrible one. Uh, followed up with Hulk Hogan, who um, once again got a really big pop in there. Adam, what's your view on Hogan when he came in and, and did his business? Yeah, I mean, uh, just to say, first of all, that uh, Mustafa was eliminated during the countdown, I believe. And considering how much he doesn't like Hogan, I reckon he did that on purpose, just to kind of try and take the shine away from uh, from Hogan coming in at that exact spot. Um, I don't like Hogan's attire for this one. Do we do we have a Mattel figure with that attire on? Which one? Uh, Hogan. Uh, Hogan's. The... We have like the USA top, I don't think so. Yeah, the flag top, yeah. No, no not yet. I'm sure it's coming. But yeah, you know, it's the right place for someone like Hogan to come in and start just eliminating people. Um, he got the Undertaker out straight away, which linked with the storyline at the time. Uh, Berserker as well, and then uh, Virgil and Duggan eliminate each other after that to set up that great WrestleMania match. <laughs> oh, well, sometimes it doesn't always lead to WrestleMania matches. Taker, uh, Taker getting eliminated is always sort of sticks in my mind as when he got thrown over and he did the old eye roll, which um, I yeah. always was a good. Yeah, good moment. Um, did well. And what? How? How else can you follow up Hulk Hogan than bringing in Skinner? Um, <laughs> Just to really 
top off that top of the top of the card moment. Um, he felt a bit like nothing, and then Sergeant Slaughter came out, who was relatively was quite a big deal back then, wasn't he? Um, so I'm surprised he, he came out and sort of didn't play much than second fiddle to everyone else, really. He was there just to elevate Sid, and what an elimination! Just mm. the best elimination of the match by a long way. Just flung himself over in the corner. Yep. He's um, come down a year later from winning the title. And then a uh, big sweaty Sid come out in 29th, which is the best uh, position for him. Um, yeah, I think Sid coming out there was great. It, it was always described during the match, oh, is, is, he, is he turning? Is he a good guy? If, is, he, is he not? I think he's, Sid's always going to be a, a bad guy, in my opinion. He's just a really good at it. I'm not sure that was teased before the Rumble. It was more the aftermath with Hogan and stuff. That he was... On the build-up, I think, on the build-up to the Rumble, yeah. like before. Um, it was mentioning all the stuff that I read about the, the pre-Rumble. That, that was one of the big things around it, was was, was Sid a good guy or not? Seemed a good guy in this match. Hmm. Um, the Warlord come out last, um, looking absolutely yeah. massive. Um, Spoiler <laughs> thriller. <laughs> this has to be the Warlord. Oh, well, thanks for that. They yeah, kind of <laughs> as he mentioned Warlord was coming out 30th before he came out 30th. I hate when they do that. Uh, I quite like the suspension now of when people come out 30th. It's trying to see someone new, aren't you? Warlord's not me, the most, uh, <laughs> most the biggest on the card, is he? Um, yeah, yeah so- I always think. Sorry, um, I just think nowadays I have to have someone really good at number thirty. Otherwise, the crowd's completely disappointed. So, it's yeah, they, maybe they kind of ruined it by having really big names come out at number thirty for a while. I don't like it now. Like when Rey Mysterio comes out or Dolph Ziggler and they get booed. I don't. I don't like that aspect. They need to need to just have a few years with somebody mediocre coming out thirtieth. Lose it. I think the um. Yeah, so I'll see both sides of the coin for that one, really. Because if if you like the we watch the rumble because of the suspension, something who's going to win, who's going to blah blah. But if everyone's already in the ring, you don't want someone who's in the ring to win it. And a Dolph Ziggler comes out, you're like, oh, this is not going to go well for me then. Whereas if you get I love Dolph Ziggler to win, so would I. But he's not going to win. You know what I mean? No, I think there's a chance. Um... 2014, 15, whatever. But, yeah, not anymore. Not at the moment. No. 20... Going, back, going back to Warlord, how long was he with um, Whippleman for? Ooh. I just, for some reason, for some reason, I've lost that memory of him being managed by Whippleman. It couldn't have been long because I don't think he lasted too much longer in WWF after this rumble, to be honest. He, he wasn't on any other pay-per-views after this. I think it was his last, like, pay-per-view performance. And before that, he was with Slick. Um, not sure when they got broke up. Um, but obviously, no sign of Slick anymore, so he must have been sacked. Slicked. Um, but yeah, this is sort of the, once again, a good bit in the rumble where everyone's just getting sort of tossed out left, right, and centre. Um, Hogan's quite involved in the whole thing because um, it's Hulk Hogan. Um, then you get the sort of breakdown of the off the match, really, when it comes to the final what, six, seven people in the ring and um, just left, right, and center, we're getting thrown out. Um, in regards to the Rumble and this sort of stage of it, is this when you're looking at, oh, who's going to win this, who you want him to win, how you, gonna, do you have a picture what the ending's going to be like before it gets to that bitch for future Rumbles? Or I think once everyone's in, you have a look and see who's in, you think, oh, I hope he wins. Hmm. Or hope he doesn't win, and obviously, when if that person does get thrown out, you think, Oh, well, fine, I hope it's him rather than him. I think that's what they've been doing the last few years when they've been putting Roman Reigns as the last one eliminated. So, whoever wins is going to get cheered at least at that point when Roman was getting booed all the time, you know. Because you even appreciate if that Randy Orton won a run because it wasn't Roman Reigns, so yeah. they've done that a lot. Definitely, and I think one thing I used to always love around this sort of time is when the Hill commentators used to pick their favourites for the match and that would change throughout. Jerry Lawler did it for a bit, which was quite funny, but then he did it every single rumble and then just got very, very tiresome. So, um, 
I think back then having a rumble that actually meant something and winning the title definitely put that extra spin on it, didn't it? I mean, we we obviously know how it went um, we, at the very end, but it was a really interesting dynamic and one that we probably won't see again, or if a similar thing happens, maybe where you've got three big faces and one heel left at the end of a rumble. Mm. Um, you're probably not going to see that for quite a long time. Yeah, you know, it's, it's normally the other way around, isn't it? It's normally one baby face will overcome the three big heels. Normally, Big Show, uh, not anymore, but. In the case, yeah, um, yes, yeah, so obviously, Savage went and he got thrown out, left with the final three, uh, left with Sid, Hogan, and, and Flair. Which normally, um, oh, go on, crack on, yeah, just, just before we go at the end, and then, um, and that debate, uh, Monsoon, the Monsoon actually, you know, he, he's had a, a turnaround of how he feels about Ric Flair. He's Ric Flair's won Monsoon's respect for his performance throughout, um. You know, he's lasted all this time and, and you know, Monsoon went into it saying he had no chance and gradually, gradually Monsoon had built up his respect for, for Ric Flair, which you could probably say this is probably the one of the best babyface performances by anyone ever in a Royal Rumble. And this is for a hail called Ric Flair. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's different to the Mysterio one because Mysterio one, he just sort of hid throughout the majority of it. Flair was actually taking a, a beating. Yeah, he? For, <laughs> yeah. Um, kept so. coming back for more as well. Yeah. yeah. Back. Um, but yeah, this is the final three. We're left with the Sid, Hogan and, and Flair. Um, normally with the final three, and especially one for the title, it will go on for ages and then obviously occasionally when we get thrown out. This just felt very like bang, 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 didn't it? Yeah, it had to be for what they were trying to accomplish. Yeah. Um, of, of Sid throwing out Hogan completely legally and completely within his rights to do so, as Hogan had yep. done to friends in the last couple of years, because <laughs> uh, it's the rules of the Rumble, uh, every man for himself, but because it's Hogan, it's not on, apparently. Um, yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, Hogan acted like a crybaby, a bad loser, the biggest heel in the whole match. Yeah, just I... baffling the way they booked Hulk Hogan in that match. It doesn't make sense. Why would anyone cheer him after he'd done that? If it was the other way around, it would have made a lot more sense. If yeah. it was Hogan that threw out Sid, who then took a bit of, oh, oh you bloody Hogan... And then grabbed his hand and then flared through. It would have made a hundred times more sense, but yeah, we want to get in his rights to do so. Um, but Hogan's thrown out, just as he did to Macho Man a few years prior, um, just thrown out by his friend, and then, yeah, turns a bit of a baby about it. I think they could have they could have done the whole thing without the, ha- the arm grab. Yeah. And I think the arm grab was extended um, because Sid wasn't going to go over the ropes properly. So the arm grab was extended in the end. Um, but, you know, they could have achieved the whole thing with Hogan arguing with Sid uh, and then Flair sneaking up on him and getting him out. I don't think they desperately needed the, the arm grab. Either that or Jamie's idea where um, Sid elim- sorry, Hogan eliminated yeah. Sid. Yeah. And Sid did the heel turn, the heel stuff, because he was turned heel. So, yeah, it made no sense the way... The way Hogan was booked here. No, completely asked backwards, isn't they? Um, or losing. Yeah, that's that's what it come across as. It's just yeah, throwing his toys out the pram. But he couldn't have had it three years in a row, could he? Greedy guts. Um, yeah, it so was just so Hogan could be in the ring at the end. Yeah, that was all. I thought so it would finish with Hogan. Hogan probably didn't even know about this interview that was going to happen. I reckon um, Hogan probably thought the whole show was going to end with him and Sid just yeah. in that ring against each other. Hmm. Um, yeah, it did it, take a bit of like the shine away from the overall win, didn't it? Of just them two big but it, on that side. But it was it was meant to, you know. Fleur, he wasn't going to get the crowd reaction. He wasn't going to get that. It, it was done perfectly with Fleur going off straight away and getting that interview in, as history has shown. Hmm. Um, yeah, I think one thing I was point out as well from uh, well the mania that followed this, which we'll probably cover soon was that Sid and Hogan was the main event for that rather than the title match, which 
Go figure. It's almost like he had an ego, wasn't it? Yeah. Strange. Um, but yeah, as you mentioned, it comes to the interview at the end and Ric Flair, which I've set up lovely just here, if you can see Flair and perfect. The house is there. Um, iconic interview for Flair. Uh, really put him on the map. Even though it was a world title, I think this elevated him a bit to a, sort of the top level guy, really. Um, looking back on it, it's just an iconic promo. It is. Um, you, you, you must place this in the top five promos of all time. The way, you know, Flair delivers it, it's it's real as well. Like what he says is real. It, it's not like a scripted promo. It's not even just how his character feels. It's how he feels. You know, mm-hmm. this is the greatest moment of his life. He's won the best belt in the world. He's happy where he is in the WWF. This is all coming from the man himself, not the character. So brilliant. It's like you said earlier, it almost has that feel of I've done it as a baby face. Mm. Almost. Yeah. But it still works as the heel as well. Yeah. Um, I think just that little like, the crazy eyes, the blood over his face and everything just mixed in with his his white hair just was yeah, was perfect, I think. You know, that um Jack Tony congratulating Rick Flair shaking Jack Tony's hand, very baby face of him. Um normally heels would just snatch the belt and say uh, go away Tony or whatever and not shake his hand but yeah play like a baby face and for that reason I think that's what made it so special I think perfect as well being in the background just with his like coaching outfit on as if they'd planned the whole thing um, statistic or tactically that was quite a good little touch as well yeah. they told you so hmm it's quite good um, yeah we'll bring this episode to a, to a close with a tear in my eye again um, but yeah one of the most iconic rambles of all time um, one you can go back and sit through over and over again um, just from how, how good it is um, so yeah I'm glad that it's 30 years since then it makes you feel old wow crazy mm, wow indeed um, but yeah thanks for your time there boys I think it's been a uh, the long one has been fun to watch in the episode. So, yeah, Adam, thanks for your, uh, your time and your input. Thank you very much. Still fuming about Macho Man. <laughs> I think Hogan's still fuming about Sid. So, uh, uh, Johnny, thanks for yours as well. Yeah, and thanks for depressing me about the 30 years comment just before we ended. Hey, we're all right. That's what we're here for, isn't it? <laughs>